Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. It's Open Line First Monday, and that's the uh, time when you are an even more important part of our program. Your questions by phone or email set the stage for our discussion tonight. My guest this evening is Stephen Clifford. He's uh, second time on the program. He was here uh, about a year ago, November 1999. Steve is a, a Mormon convert to the Catholic Church. And I know the first time uh, we were on the program, a uh, lot of questions, more than questions. we could answer in that one hour, and that was a great incentive to have you back. So even though it's open line, uh, part of the emphasis tonight will be questions about Mormonism, if that's what you want to ask tonight. So you can even start calling us now at 1-800-221-9460, or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN. Dot com. Stephen, welcome back to The Journey Home. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to have you back. I was wondering, uh, as we were preparing this afternoon, I knew there was a reason besides the fact that I wanted you to come back for Open Line First Monday, and uh, it was because your story has just recently been printed in its entirety in Surprised by Truth 2. Right. And I'm, in fact, trying to get all the those featured in this book on the program as I can over the next year. So if you want the whole story, look into Surprised by Truth 2, which you can get either through EWTN's catalog or probably the Coming Home Network. Uh, you can call our number later. But it's always good when we start the open line right. to give a bit of a summary to remind them about your journey. Certainly. I was born and raised um, in the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, LDS or Mormon, as mm -hmm. they're sometimes called. I'm a fifth generation Mormon um, my um, ancestors go all the way back to 1832. They joined the Mormon Church about two years after Joseph Smith founded the church. So the first generation? The first, wow. very first uh, Mormons uh, were, were some of my ancestors. Wow. And eventually they ended up out in Utah in 1852. So they made the big um, trek out there? They made the big trek out there, <laughs> right. Were they in the movie? The <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they were in the movie, but uh, the movie was about that, that period That's of right. time. That's right. um, but it was, it was a difficult time for my family. They uh, went through the persecution that the Mormon Church went through and suffered through in uh, Missouri, uh, Clay County, Missouri, and Jackson County, Missouri. And um, once they made it out to Utah, then, then the Mormons settled in and, and really mm -hmm. started to, to grow and pros prosper. Uh, I was raised in the Mormon Church. Um, I, I went to church. I did all of the things that the good Mormon youth are supposed to do. <laughs> and uh, went through the Mormon Seminary program in my high school. And when I uh, turned 18 years old, um, I decided that I was not ready for a mission. Mm -hmm. So I uh, joined Is that them. normal? It's normal for... Did they have an option, uh, yes or no? Right. Th they have an option, but the pressure is certainly there to okay. go on the mission. And I, I got a lot of pressure to go on a mission. Um, I just didn't feel like I was ready to do that at that mm -hmm. point in my life. And the military, even though it was at the height of Vietnam, seemed like a, <laughs> a, a better option for me at that point. That's so, interesting. Yeah. You'd rather go to Vietnam than <laughs> the mission field. <laughs> right. Very interesting. <laughs> but I, I ended up in Germany, actually, which was a blessing. Um, I, in Germany, I met and married my wife, Anna. And um, she uh, was Catholic at the time that we were dating. And we were married by a Catholic priest. Um, I. Uh, was a Mormon uh, at that time, and I remained a Mormon for 22 years of our married life. Wow. Hmm. Uh, I was an active Mormon. Uh, I was active for the first year that I left home, and then I I became inactive. Okay. Um, and uh, actually, I became an active uh, non-Catholic, if you will. I <laughs> I uh, sp went to Catholic mass a lot with my wife and and my two daughters. Hmm. Uh, I had agreed that our daughters would be raised Catholic. And uh, so we did that. We raised them Catholic, and I went to the masses, and I, 
Um, went to First Communion with my daughters and did all of those things that fathers should do. But I was not going to be a Catholic. <laughs> that, that was just not one of the options that I was holding open. Um, so it twisted your arm. Things changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were a lot of things I think that happened in my life at that point. I um, really had been introduced to uh, the Rosary through the Schoenstatt Rosary mm -hmm. campaign, and uh, uh, the ro I started praying the Rosary, and I uh, began to recognize the important role that Mary played in the life of Jesus. And um, there, like I say, there were a number of things that happened, but certainly uh, uh, the Rosary brought me uh, closer to Mary. And um, I think uh, listening to Scott Hahn was probably the catalyst that forced me to get off the fence. I heard Scott Hahn give a talk and, and I determined in my mind that I was going to convert Scott Hahn to Mormonism. Uh, I <laughs> felt that he had just not quite done his homework properly and ended up in the Catholic Church rather than the Mormon Church. So my initial thought was to see if I could convert him. And uh, in the process, uh, I ended up Catholic. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that's a big task uh, to decide you can take Scott Hahn on. Right. Well, I didn't realize that <laughs> at that time. I didn't really know exactly who he was. Uh, I knew that he gave a very convincing argument, so I felt that I needed to give an equally convincing argument. And that's why I, I began the research. And the more I researched on the Mormon Church, especially the er early Mormon Church history, the more I came to realize the problems and the inconsistencies and the, the things that just don't quite fit. Um, and I began to ask questions and, and uh, then I, I researched my way into the Catholic Church. Well, a little bit ago, I saw an email floating here. Maybe they could find the one I was pointing at because it, f it fits with the first question that I was going to ask okay. you, uh, at least gets in with a subject that I know that you want to talk about because there's so many questions. And our hope is that you at the home audience will have lots of questions about those men in suits that stop at your door often or riding bicycles around town. Uh, so we'll take your questions on that. But uh, this, I, I thought this one, um, this one deals with the question which you mentioned when we were at our short meeting this afternoon. Uh, so we'll take this first email. This is from George Wilson. Dear Marcus and Steve, I recently left the Mormon Church after about 16 years and returned to the Catholic Church after a powerful revelation while in the hospital. I believed in the apostasy notion, uh -huh. which I now reject, but I'm still having trouble explaining apostolic succession to my Mormon friends. How can I best explain why the apostasy is wrong and the apostolic succession is correct. <laughs> There's an introdu introduction right. right into an area that I know that you want to talk about. Yes, exactly, because I believe this is really the crux of the issue between the Mormons and, and the Catholics, um, is this issue of authority. Hmm. Who has the authority to teach and to speak on behalf of Christ? Who has the priesthood authority to act in that capacity? Um, the Mormons do believe in uh, this theory of, a, of an apostasy, uh, that the early Christian church became an apostate church, that mm -hmm. there was a total apostasy of the entire church, and that the gospel was lost from the earth, and the priesthood authority was lost from the earth. Mm -hmm. Now let me say something there. Yes. Because there are other traditions that also believe in that. Mm -hmm. There are Christian traditions that believe in that. The Church of Christ believes in that. Many fundamentalist Christians believe that everything went astray early on, and some have a hard time putting a date on when. But I'm often wondering if a lot of these groups all arose about the same time. Uh, that's, that's an interesting point. Yes, actually, I think they did. A lot of them uh, came up around the same time. And, and interestingly, um, um, upstate New York seemed to be an area <laughs> where a lot of that, uh, that was happening. That's, That's right. where the, the Mormon early Church... Right, right, 1830 is when the Mormon Church was started. Right. And there were other uh, churches uh, uh, that got their beginnings at the same, right time. the same time. Exactly, I think yeah. the whole modern idea of, uh, of the um, uh, rapture right. with Darby, right. that whole new theology, which is very popular now in the Left Behind series, mm -hmm. that was drummed up during that same time and, and Methodism, I think uh, the Methodist influence had a, had a great deal to do right. with uh, right. with that period of time as well. I'm sorry to interrupt it. Um, th there, back to the question of the apostasy, certainly that 
is the key issue in my mind. Mm -hmm. If we can um, explain and, and defend our position, and the Catholic Church position is that we have uh, apostolic succession, that um, uh, Jesus founded a church, mm -hmm. and that church that he founded was founded upon the rock of Peter. Mm -hmm. And he made a promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against this church. Mm -hmm. So we've got a promise from Christ that that the church will not fail there. There are several other places in the Bible that we have uh, similar promises of um, the uh, perpetuity of, of the church. Um, Matthew 28, 20, um, uh, go preach the gospel to all the nations and lo, I'm with you until the end of time. That's right. uh, he made that promise. Those are, those are very specific promises to be with the church and that the church would um, continue to, to exist. Um, the uh, commission to go out and preach to all the nations. Mm -hmm. You cannot go out and preach to all the nations unless the church is going to be there to back you up. So we have um, apostolic succession uh, that we look to, and, and this is demonstrated in the Bible as well when uh, Matthias was, was chosen to replace right. Judas. Um, and, and this kind of shows that, that you know, mm -hmm. another needs to take the, the bishopric, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, succeed to the apostles. Now, one of the, one of the things that sort of marks the Mormons different from us is that the Mormons believe that there should be uh, 12 living apostles at all times. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, the Bible tells us that, that the apostles had a very special and unique role and that they represented the, the 12 tribes, literally. Mm -hmm. And um, there were two criteria to be an apostle. One was that you had to, um, you had to know Christ during his life. You had to have uh, um, known him and you had to be a witness to his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Those were the two criteria for, for an apostle. And uh, certainly the Mormon apostles today do not meet that can't criteria. They that. can't claim that, right. that they're able to fit into that criteria. But we do believe that, that the successors to the apostles were not apostles themselves, but they were the bishops of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And those same bishops continue to teach um, and preach with the authority of Christ by that succession that they receive from the apostles. And the Catholic Church teaches and believes that because we see scriptural foundation for that, we see foundations in the early church for that. Right. Uh, as soon as the early persecution had ceased at the end of the fourth century, uh, end of the third century and opened mm -hmm. up there during Constantine, we see the writings flourishing and we see the, the development of apostolic succession much more public you know, during a time when to make it too public meant mm. death for all the early popes, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, what did the Mormons do, for example, with, uh, you know, John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit will be given to, for the very reason right. to give them the truth. Send and the comforter, yeah. the comforter will come. And yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. They, um, I've, I've heard Mormon apologists try to explain this by saying that the church was r really continued to exist, but it existed in heaven as opposed to existing here on earth. So um, my, my response to that is that sounds very Catholic yeah. because we have the church militant and the church triumphant <laughs> and the church suffering, you know. So we have this sort of same uh, yeah. pattern of, of the church in heaven and the church here on earth as well. They the just, communion they, they of just saints. thought that, that part of it was truncated <laughs> right. for. 1,800 eight, years. Eight, close to 1,800 years. It's hard to say exactly how long because um, you cannot get a Mormon apologist to tell you exactly when the apostasy took place. Yeah. They can show you little um, uh, phrases out of, out of the Bible, uh, parts of Scripture that may indicate that a, a apostasy perhaps was happening at that time or would happen in the future. But every reference to any sort of rebellion or apostasy or break away from the church is an apostasy um, from the church, not an apostasy of the church. And that's a very, very important uh, distinction to make. So the, 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 the image is that sometime very early, within the life of the first apostles or immediately after? Immediately after the death of the last apostle, okay. they, they think, but the, the, they can't really point can't to the it. exact time. So when the, when the original apostles are gone, sometime mm -hmm. in the first generation afterwards, the second, right. when you think about that, the amazing inability of the first apostles to spread the faith, if right. that was true, 
or the inability of the Holy Spirit to guide them into truth as Christ promised. So, I mean, it's really an absurd issue. Mm -hmm. But we envision that at some point the church is lost, the truth is lost, mm -hmm. until it's dropped down on these golden tablets to Joseph Smith in right. 1830, right? I mean, right. we'll go to that in a second, but I, I guess I also want to challenge those who come from non-Catholic traditions that carry a similar idea. Mm -hmm. Again, that sometime early on, the truth of the Christian faith was lost, and then it was discovered later by some inspira inspired teacher. And to think about the problem of that, mm -hmm. not just in relationship to Mormonism, but any of these other groups that claim separate authority from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I don't want to name any of the reformers or something, but there's really not a whole lot of difference. Right. Because and that's why, uh, getting back to what you're saying, the authority issue, if anyone wants to claim authority today or that the founder of their particular tradition had this authority, they always have to end up with that kind of an explanation. Right. That somehow it was lost. It was lost somehow. And, and I think one of the other important scripture references that we can use is 1 Timothy 3.15. The pillar and foundation or bulwark of the truth is the church. church. The yeah. church. And if it's the pillar and foundation of the truth, how can it, in, in a few years after Christ had instituted the church and made these promises, vanish? Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, Many try and, and uh, bridge that gap by saying, well, it's the Bible. The Bible was there all the way through. But again, if you look at history, the Bible as we know it was not collected, the canon wasn't collected until sometime in the fourth century. Right. 392 and Three, 397. So if you know history, you realize that that's yeah. an absurd option, which is even gets us into Mormonism uh, in the idea that these golden tablets that represent the truth that Joseph mm -hmm. Smith supposedly discovered, were they created then? Or had they been preserved? Yeah, How does that, Mormonism teach that idea? <laughs> How do, where did the Book of Mormon come from, I guess, is a, yeah. probably the better uh, question. The Book of Mormon really is a history of an ancient people that the Mormons believe um, um, were on the North American continent, um, and, and South America, and Central America. Um, the history of these two civilizations starts with a um, um, the happenings at the Tower of Babel, when okay. when the um, the tongues were, you know, the people were confounded mm -hmm. by the uh, languages, and the Mormons believed that at that time there was a man named Jared that brought um, his his people across to the South and Central America, and this is about 2200 B.C. Mm -hmm. that they they claimed the Jaredites uh, settled in the uh, South and, and Central American uh, area. These uh, Jaredite people uh, lived until about 200 B.C., at which time there was a great battle uh, at the Hill Cumorah in upstate New York, and about two million of the Jaredites died in this battle, and uh, the Jaredite people uh, vanished from, from the earth. Mm -hmm. But also in conjunction with that, there was another civilization that started up about 600 B.C., and um, these people were uh, descendants of Lehi. The uh, two sons were named uh, Nephi and uh, Laman. So the, the two peoples that came from Lehi were the Nephites and the Lamanites. And uh, the story in they the Book of Mormon. lamination? Or the <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. And, and the story is that um, these people lived on the American continent from 600 B.C. until about 421 A.D. And the Book of Mormon talks about how Christ, um, after his crucifixion, yeah. came to the American continent and visited with this ancient people and preached the same gospel that he preached in the, in the old country, in the Holy Land, and uh, established the same church with 12 apostles um, and, uh, and told them to go out and preach and teach the gospel yeah. just like they did in This in is Jerusalem. in the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, yeah, This right. is where this, all this comes from. This is where right. this comes from. They, um, there was a great battle in the year um, around 421, again at the Hill Cumorah in upstate New York, and uh, the Nephites, who were the good people, were all slain by the Lamanites, who were the, the evil people. And eventually the Nephites disappeared from the earth. 
this is the record that was left behind <coughs> by the prophets all the way from uh, back at the time of, of Jared and talking mm -hmm. about the Jaredites up through the Nephites and the Lamanites. The last, um, one of the last prophets was named Mormon and his son uh, Moroni was the one that buried up the plates in, in the hill. And, and uh, the plates were buried um, from about 421 A.D. until um, 1827 when Joseph Smith was allowed to, uh, allegedly allowed to uncover them and to translate them. And then the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, about the time the church was, was started. Hmm. Well, I know that the, I've never read the Book of Mormon. Uh, I think at one point I received my own copy from the missionaries and glanced through it a mm -hmm. number of years ago. But uh, yet an, it's, it's still an amazing book that has convinced millions of people. Right. Right. And we have another email which tags right into what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is Michael from Falls City. Dear Steve, I've heard that there isn't any archaeological evidence in support of the Book of Mormon, but an LDS missionary told me otherwise. Is there? Right. That's a, it's very interesting. The um, Brigham Young University, which is a, an LDS school, um, has got archaeologists and researchers and historians that have been working on this for years and years to try to find evidence to support um, the uh, Book of Mormon. Um, they would claim that they have plenty of evidence to support it. Um, I know of absolutely no um, archaeologist, historian, any, any, anyone with any credibility outside of the LDS okay. uh, channels that, that would um, even consider the Book of Mormon to be historically accurate and correct. Um, and they, they wouldn't use it for any, any sort of uh, What's reference. an altered explanation to the source of this book? Um, w what's happening, well, uh, there, there are a lot of theories on where it came from. One of them is, um, and, and it, it looks like it's pretty well justified, that there are a lot of passages in the Book of Mormon that um, come almost directly word for word out of the King James Version of the Bible. Now, the King James Version of the Bible was brought to us in about uh, 1611, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Right. Um, and it's interesting that this book that was laid up in, in 421 uh, is using precisely the same King's English um, that the King James Version of the Bible uses in, in a lot of... In the 17th century, which would right. have been different than the English spoken by Joseph and the, right. and the gang in the 1800s. Right, right. right. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so th there's the been... The English language didn't even exist in the 400s. Right, right. Yeah. right. Absurd. And, uh, of course, the, um, the Book of Mormon was allegedly translated from these golden plates, which by the way, um, are no longer here for us to look at as evidence. They uh, supposedly were taken back up into heaven. So we really don't have any evidence other than the testimony of Joseph Smith yeah. um, that they existed. He also had some witnesses, of course. He wanted to try to make sure everybody believed it. So he had some witnesses to testify um, as to the accuracy and the, and the truth of the Book of Mormon. It's interesting of the, um, the eight the 11 witnesses, there were a total of 11 witnesses um, to the Book of Mormon. Eight of them uh, left the Mormon church. Some of them came back to the Mormon church, but mm. the majority of them stayed away from stayed the Mormon away. church. And these witnesses were primarily from the Smith family and from another family, uh, the Whitmer family. So right. they, they really were not uh, the most um, unbiased and, and, uh, uh, of witnesses. There's been a, a whole lot written about Joseph Smith himself and mm -hmm. his integrity and, and all of that. And of course, once, once you become a persecuted people, right. then, uh, then there's, there's, the <clears throat> there's the claim whenever we would point out something negative that we're being prejudiced or, right. or bigoted. Right. And it's very important that we don't fall into that trap of trying to, to um, persecute the individual or to uh, condemn the individual or uh, belittle the individual. And we're not talking about people individually. We're talking about the, the belief system. Um, Mormonism started off, the claims of Joseph Smith was that he was told by God mm -hmm. that um, all churches were wrong, that they were all mm -hmm. apostate, that uh, none of them had the truth and that he would have the truth revealed to him. So the, you know, I mean the original claims from Joseph Smith were that we are all wrong and that's, that includes yeah. Catholic Church. 
that uh, our claims to, to the truth and, and to, to the historical facts simply uh, are not accurate. And, and so I, you know, it's incumbent on them to explain to us, um, you know, what they believe and then allow us to explain what we believe as well. Um, you mentioned earlier the issue of authority mm -hmm. in the Mormon church. Um, talk a little bit about that because you just said what Joseph Smith claimed, all of the churches were apostate. Right. Only the Mormons are the true church. Is that still what they teach? Uh, yes. Um, they, they don't say it as loudly and as boldly and as um, uh, confrontational as they used to, but yes, I, I mean, um, in order to claim that they're the true church, all other churches can't be yeah. true. All right. um, you can't have um, our truth, which is totally opposite from their truth, um, also be the truth. So if, if their truth is true, then that makes our truth false. And so we, you know, we need to, we need to come to grips with what is truth and what, what is the truth so that we can make sure that we're following um, it seems course. to set the stage for an awkward question which often arises, and that is the other side, people, well, are the Mormons Christians? Mm -hmm. Talk about that from your own okay. journey of faith. It's very important. The Mormons um, today are, are um, going to extreme measures to um, kind of mainstream themselves into the Christian uh, like community. Like they give away free <coughs> King James Bibles on television. They do. Um, and, uh, of course, they have the name of Jesus and the name of their church. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're very um, interested in trying to portray themselves as being Christian, and um, they would they would tell you that they are a Christian uh, mm -hmm. church. They believe in Jesus Christ. They're followers of Christ, and therefore they are Christian. I think it's very important that we define exactly what we mean by Christian, mm -hmm. because um, what we understand to be Christianity and what the Mormons understand may not be the same thing. We may be using the same terms. Yeah. But the definitions are different. So yeah. I find it, it really useful to go back and try to define exactly what we mean by what is a Christian. Belief in one God. This is yeah. my, my understanding now after, as, after a having, as a Catholic. Belief in one God, uh, the creator of, of all things. Mm -hmm. um, um, we also believe in the, the Trinity. Right. Three persons and one divine nature. And that's extremely important because the Mormons um, see God and see Christ as being one of many gods, mm -hmm. and that the ultimate goal of, of every Mormon male is to eventually attain godhood themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, from that perspective, if we're talking about a Christian being... Now we're talking about two we're different talking about two different Christ, things. Right. Who is Christ? God, the Holy Spirit, right. who we are, our nature, our all nature. of this is completely different. Exactly. Different pages. Exactly. So if we can come to that understanding of the definitions, and if I tell you what my definition of Christianity is, and by the way, I'm not making this up. It's 2,000 years worth of tradition and, right. and Catholic teaching and, and uh, understanding of what Christ taught and what the apostles taught and uh, what was mm -hmm. written and, and canonized in the scripture. That's where we get our faith from. It is very interesting on this program how often the subject is always brought back to the issue of authority. Mm -hmm. Who has the authority to determine what is true? How would we <coughs> understand Christ? And from the very beginning of the church, there were all these other groups that had a new gospel, and that's what the church had to, had to fight and many people to die for the defense of what was the true understanding of the gospel, as opposed to those who had stepped over the line into things that seemed very similar, right. but not the same. Right. I mean, we as, as Christians talk about uh, growing um, in the divine life mm -hmm. as we re become in union with Christ, but we don't become gods. Right. It's a completely different understanding. Let's take a break. We'll be back with your questions for Steve on his journey or anything else that might come to your mind as you've heard about Stephen talking about his journey from the Mormon faith into the Catholic Church. Be with you in just a moment.
Welcome back. My guest for this evening is Stephen Clifford. He's here for the second time talking about his journey from the, his uh, five-generation Mormon mm. upbringing into the Catholic faith. And I really do believe that many of the questions that you're, you're dealing with deal with more than just the Mormon church. They have to deal with the issue of authority right. to determine which is the true dependable Christian authority to determine what is true mm -hmm. and must be believed. Uh, and you mentioned earlier to me this afternoon a book that you recommended to, to folk. Maybe you could mention to Yes, them. I've, uh, one of the books that I read that was very, very helpful to me was a, uh, a small booklet called A Christian Looks at Mormonism. And it was written by um, Father William J. Mitchell. Um, he's now retired, but he was a priest in Utah for many, many years. And he wrote this little booklet on uh, uh, Mormonism from a Christian perspective, really trying to um, help people to understand what the Mormons teach and believe, mm -hmm. and this, the, the similarities and the differences between uh, Christianity and, and Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I found the booklet to be probably the, the best explanation of Mormonism from a Catholic perspective. Um, that that I uh, recommend to anybody. Uh, it's a, it's an extremely good book. I have it available on my website along with a lot of other uh, information on Mormonism. All right. Um, I think your website, if it isn't right now, at some point during the program, your website will be posted, right. where you can get actually download the entire copy of this book. Although this book may also be published by Catholic, Catholic Answers. Answers. I think it's got, uh, they should still have the book available right. there, yes. And, and, and it it's, a, it's a great book. Um, it, it is written very honestly, openly. Um, it is not, um, like some of the books that I've read have been very, very critical of Mormons, the yeah. people themselves, and, and uh, have said things that, that I thought were uncharitable. uncharitable. Yeah. 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 And uh, I found that this book was very, very fair in, in the way they that he dealt with it. All right, let's take our next email. This is uh, from James Janda. Dear Mr. Clifford, how is the LDS Church able to convince their youth to go on two-year missionary trips? As Catholics, can we learn anything from them in giving our own youth a missionary spirit? Right, that's a great question. Um, the Mormons do encourage their youth to go on missions. Uh, it is a two-year mission, and they do it at their own expense. Yeah. Um, and it, it's quite a commitment because they, um, they could go any place in the world and they're very, very limited in what they can do and who they can contact while they're on the mission. But there's a lot of pressure from um, their parents, uh, other people within the Mormon church, the bishop in the Mormon church, a lot of pressure there to go on the mission. It's what you're supposed to do. That's, that's key. It's an expectation right. from the top of the church to the bottom. Absolutely. That yep. this is a part of your journey. Right. So maybe what we learn from them is what are, what are the expectations that we have on our young people? Do we right. expect them to make this commitment? Obviously right. we don't, even though we're all called to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Every one of us has that call, but we mm -hmm. kind of just presume. Mm -hmm. and right. Like the issues of vocations in the church. Right. You know, we should have that expectation for all of our young people. And uh, the th thing that the Mormons have going for them, they've got 60,000 of these young kids out in the mission field wow. um, right now preaching and teaching the Mormon uh, beliefs, and they are having great success. Mm -hmm. And the majority of their converts are coming from traditionally Catholic countries now, mm -hmm. uh, South and Central America. So we, by far, are losing more Catholics to the LDS mm -hmm. Church than, than we're getting Mormons into the Catholic Church. Um, they're their church is about 11 million strong right now. Okay. And uh, given the current growth rate, they're doubling their f numbers every 15 years. Wow. Yeah. At a local gathering, you know, in your local community, um, who heads that little group? Is it a layman? Or? The, the missionaries? No, I mean like a little, at the LDS church down the corner. Uh, yes, the, um, they have what they call a bishop, um, and they're broken down into wards. Um, a ward would be about 300 families, and the leader of that ward is called a bishop, and he has two counselors, and those callings are all from the laity. They mm -hmm. are not paid any money for um, mm -hmm. the work that they do. They do receive some training um, and, and preparation in order for them to fill that capacity, but they're, um, they're called to that job, and they do it uh, in addition to whatever mm -hmm. full-time work they do. 
All right, thank you for that. Let's take our first caller this evening. This is Carolyn from New York. What's your question for us tonight? Hi. Good evening, Marcus. Good Thank evening. you for taking my call. Sure. And um, I'd like to direct my question to Stephen mm -hmm. uh, as an ex-Mormon. The name of the, the Mormon church, the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, I've often wondered what the name means, where they got the, the word saints from, what is it referred to, because I don't believe they, they believe in saints the way we do. So what does that name actually mean, if you don't mind answering that? Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. Sure, that's a great question. They, um, they actually looked to the, um, the New Testament where a lot of the early Christians were called saints and, and um, they consider themselves to be saints. Every one of the members of their church is, is considered a saint. They're, they're Latter-day Saints on earth. And um, so they, they do see a, a, a biblical foundation for calling them, themselves saints. Are all the Mormon churches called Latter-day Saints? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's kind of a touchy question because th there, there are actually uh, over a hundred different variations of, Is that of right? the, um, the I thought it was about two or three. No, no, there's, there's over a hundred of them. And, and the, um, the split off of the, the church began huh. even while Joseph Smith was still alive. But um, most of the, um, the main body of the Mormons followed Brigham Young after Joseph Smith was, was killed in the Carthage jail. And uh, they ended up out in Utah, but Joseph Smith's family refused to accept Brigham Young as the successor to Joseph Smith. Uh, they they believed that their um, that Joseph's oldest son had a, a patriarchal blessing to be his successor, and they felt that it was it was a patriarchal church that that the father passes the leadership to the son, so the leadership needed to remain in the Smith family in order for the church to be to be. Uh, continue on. So eventually the Smith family came back and founded the reorganized Church of, of well, Jesus Christ. Right. Is that the group that was in Ohio? Um, they're in Independence, Missouri. Okay. They're headquartered in Independence, Missouri, and um, they're probably the second largest after the Utah um, uh, group. But there were also a number of other groups that broke away at the same time. and, and uh, all some of them of looking back, though, to Joseph Smith? All of them looking back. Okay. Some of them accept only the Book of Mormon as um, the inspired scripture that they accept. They don't accept the, the uh, other two books that Mormons consider part of their uh, standard works, the, the Pearl of Great Price and the uh, Doctrine and Covenants. And also, um, they, don't, they didn't accept the original teachings on the plurality of gods and polygamy. That was a big problem for, for a lot of those that were broke those, away. Were those often issues that continually divided? And yes, yes. All right, okay. I know racism was an issue at one point, right? It was, yes. Yeah, the um, Mormon church up until 1978 would not allow uh, blacks to hold the priesthood. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it was considered that, that blacks had the curse of Cain and um, you know, Cain killed Abel and was cursed with a darkness of skin, and that darkness mark of skin, the, it, the mark. It's but they really believe the mark was a darkness of skin, which is the the. Uh, right. the and that's African. interesting about their authority. It's an example of, you know, as Catholic, the Catholic Church, our magisterium around the seat of Peter does, Peter does not believe that they can change. Right. Uh, given the whims of culture, the pressures of culture, and we know that from the last thirty years, when there's been a tremendous amount of pressure mm -hmm. on the Vatican to change some some uh, opinions in morality that our, our cultures are finding uncomfortable, right? right? Well, it seems to me in the history of, of Mormonism there have been some major changes. Lots of changes. Polygamy is one, one example of that. The um, doctrine of polygamy was considered to be an everlasting uh, um, covenant. And uh, th that, was, that was supposed to be here for all time. And uh, the pressure came to bear from the United States government on the, the people out in Utah to um, to stop it, because you know, of course, yeah. it's against the law to have more than one wife. And so, uh, in 1890, the Mormon Church suspended uh, polygamy as as a practice. Right. But they there's still a large group that still practice that. Is that a separate breakaway? It's now? a breakaway group, right? Okay. Because the official um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints position is that you you cannot and you do not practice polygamy. And if right. if they're caught practicing polygamy, they're excommunicated. All right, let's take our next caller. This is Mary from Kansas. Mary, what's your question for us tonight? Uh, uh, it's for Mr. Clifford. Yes. I wondered if Mormons have baptism 
And if so, was his accepted by the Catholic Church? <laughs> Thank you for your question. Great, good question. Uh, yes, Mormons do baptize. They baptize at the age of eight. Uh, so all, all children would have to wait until they're eight years old. That's what they consider the age of reason. Um, the baptism is for the remission of personal sins. Uh, they don't don't uh, baptize for the the original sin oh, okay. uh, as we do. They don't see that as being uh, something that was carried on from yeah. from Adam down through the generations. Mm. So um, original sin was Adam and Eve's problem and not ours, basically. <laughs> um, so their baptism is for personal sin. Um, so what happens after baptism? Uh, Got to stay clean. <laughs> Um, they, they, what happens when you? They they do have a, sort of a, a semi uh, confession type of a repentance and mm -hmm. and uh, speak with the bishop, this lay person, and uh, confess your sins and and mm -hmm. uh, and be reconciled. So they do have. Um, it's important to to repent in the mm -hmm. Mormon Church if you do commit sins, and you need to be. Um, um, a good practicing Mormon in order to partake of all of the um, things that, that Mormons are supposed to do, especially the temple ceremonies. Hmm. It, it's been fascinating to me. I don't, I don't know if we talked about this last time we were on the show, but so part of Mormonism is a very strict regimentation of your life. Yes. It Getting is your life. control of your life. Right. And that it's connected with your eternal uh, role your as right. a, a God. Right. On, I'm, and I'm not sure how the theological put that, but I've, I found it interesting that many of the the uh, the daytimer programs, mm -hmm. the Franklin, the Covey, right. very deep connections to the Mormon right. Church. Does right. that come out of their theology? Um, I, I think the two of them are, are related in a way, um, and and you see a lot of, you know, the the Mormon, um, the missionaries are very very well trained sells people, yeah. basically. Yeah. They have a product and they sell it very, very well. So I, I, I think there is a relationship and I believe yeah. um, that um, all the, the, you know, the, the Marriott family and the Marriott Hotels is a, is a good, strong Mormon family and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, their links to the church their and their, their business That's right. um, sort of But as a part of it, their, their discipline of right. life. The we can learn from that. I mean, it's a yep. good aspect of that we all should be as yep. disciplined. And, and, and wonderful people, and, and they've got a very um, strong work ethic and, and really work hard and do very well at it. I don't think we answered the question totally on the baptism, though, oh, as sure, to okay. whether or not well, it's um, accepted. my baptism is accepted in the Catholic Church. When I came into the Catholic Church, I um, asked for, and the priest wanted to give me, what's called a conditional baptism. Um, in the event that I had been baptized before and the baptism was valid, then this conditional baptism would not be necessary. Mm. But if it was not valid, then the conditional baptism is the baptism yeah. of record, right. if you will. Um, I'm very glad I got the conditional baptism. I do believe that, um, that we need to have a, a Christian baptism in yeah. order to, to come into, f into the full communion with the Christian church. We need that. And, and the reason I say that is because we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it's important that we understand that we're baptizing in the right Father and right. Son and Holy the Spirit, the Trinity, That's and right. not three separate gods. Hmm. Very good. Let's take this email. It comes from Todd in Bridgeport. Dear Steve, what is the role of Mary in the Mormon Church? Um, Mary is, is um, just sort of there. I, she's, she's the mother of Jesus. Um, it was taught at one time, it was very controversial teaching, that Mary... Um, and, and God the Father had physical relations, and that is how the Son was, was mm -hmm. uh, uh, created, through the normal physical relations. God the Father has a physical body of uh, flesh and bones. He is a um, resurrected being, um, um, so he's different than, yeah. than the, the beings on earth, but um, Brigham Young taught that, that um, you, know, you know. This illustrates what happens and this can happen all the time when a person decides to rely on individual interpretation. Mm -hmm. Because there are many scriptures in the Old Testament where we see expressions of God, you know, he re God repents, mm -hmm. uh, he's upset, he's angry, um, that are using human characteristics to describe an indescribable God. 
Right. So unless you have an authority that teaches you to how to understand that, you can have, you can come up with a very description of a physical, emotional, sure. changeable God. Sure. And, and I think oftentimes what happens is that we try to make God into the likeness and image of man. Oh. And, and we try to make man into the likeness and image of God. And therefore, you know, we want to be just like God. And, um, you know, you go back to Genesis, it's the oldest temptation that the, that the serpent used, you know, take, partake of the, the forbidden fruit and you'll be just like God. In fact, there are, uh, I only have the New Testament with me tonight, but there's an Old Testament psalm where, where David talks about us being gods. Mm -hmm. All right, well, taken out of its context, it or out of the context of the entire scriptures, you can end up with where the Mormons have ended up. Right. And, right. and sadly, that's what happens whenever you step over the bounds of the authority that, that Christ gave the church, guided by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important of the theology of the church to its, re its responsibility to define what is true Christianity right. versus the counterfeits. And who holds the keys to that authority. And I, I would like to point out too, for those that are interested in more information, I have had a... Um, online debate on my website with an, a uh, LDS apologist. And we have, it's quite an extensive debate that we carried on um, on this issue of who holds the keys, Pope mm -hmm. or prophet. Mm -hmm. And he gave some very, very strong arguments from the, the Mormon side, and what Mormons would consider their best arguments yeah. on the total apostasy theory. And I tried to provide as best as I could the Catholic perspective on apostolic succession. So if anybody's interested in, in a very lengthy and detailed uh, um, debate and the information is available on the website. Well, it sounds like a very great informative website that again I hope is posted. I um, delivered a message to my staff back in, <laughs> in uh, Zanesville, Ohio, that we make sure that your website is linked, if it isn't already, to it, our... I believe it is. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, because we're hooked together. We want to make sure we have the resources available for people whenever they have a question. Right. Let's take our next caller, Judy from Minnesota. What's your question for us? Hello. It's such a thrill to, to talk with you. I accidentally you. turned the show on. Just flipping through the channel. No I such didn't thing as an accident. There. <laughs> and there it was, former Mormon. I thought, whoa, that's me. <laughs> I left the Mormon church 15 years ago, uh, and it was home. such a big part of my life that I've been, for the first few years, I searched uh, from one church to another trying mm. to fill that void. Although I'm sure i positive I did the right thing in yes. leaving the Mormon church. It's been very hard, and right now I'm yeah. sort of letting things slide yes. in that respect. My question was this. Um, when you decided to leave the Mormon Church for the Catholic Church, uh, it was, it kind of came upon you gradually as you went to church with your wife and children. Right. Do you think if you hadn't been married to a Catholic, you would have done the same thing? Thank you for your it's a, it's a good question. I would hope and pray that God would have helped me along in this uh, experience with or without uh, my wife's prayers. Certainly she was there and praying for me and introduced me to the Catholic Church and, and she was very instrumental in, in that. But you know, the bottom line is the Holy Spirit um, worked in me and, and opened my eyes and opened my heart to the truth. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that. Um, you know, being open to the truth. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, you know, my situation being married to a Catholic was great because I had that exposure and I was able to do that. But there are a lot of Mormons out there that don't have that exposure that we need to provide for them. Yeah, we need to go out there and reach out to them and explain what it is the Catholic Church teaches and believes mm -hmm. and help them to come to Jesus. Keep them in prayer. You know, those of you who've watched this program week after week know that almost every single conversion. On the one hand, whether it was uh, they read a scripture verse or they listened, you know, they happened to read a document or the early church fathers, and it's always in relationship to a person. Right. It brings us in relationship to the person of Jesus Christ. But it's the witness of a human being alive that makes the sale. Right. All right. On the other hand, it's also the relationships that can prevent people, hold people back. Mm -hmm. And that's my guess is that your journey into the Catholic faith out of your lifelong Mormonism was rough. 
It was very hard. Family, yeah. friends, everything you knew. Right. Family tradition. And, and it, it would have been much easier to stay where I was at, um, certainly. And, and that was where I was comfortable, and that was where I was determined to stay. And um, my wife did not put any pressure on me to convert. Yeah. Um, it was something that happened inside of me. It yeah. was something that just Which made me. Which always has to be the right, case. Right, right. It's got to be in here. So it was. Um, it's a personal thing. You've you've got to have that relationship with Christ individually, me myself, yeah. and and Jesus has right. got to come into your life, and um, when that happens, and if you are open to the Spirit working in you, then then things happen, yeah. and they happen rapidly. Well, here's an email from Lisa Carlson in Nebraska. Dear Steve, I know a little bit about early Christian writers and know that the Trinity is discussed, if not the word, at least the idea. How do Mormons discuss this early witness? Um, actually, this Mormon apologist used the early church fathers in a lot of his arguments. And it, it, if you search hard enough, yeah. you can find just about anything to support whatever uh, which, preconceived notions you go into the search. Which with. is true of Scripture itself. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, if you if you read this apologist's arguments, you will find him using the early church fathers to support the total apostasy mm -hmm. theory, um, and and you could probably uh, find um, you know Arianism and and other heresies that the church combated from the very beginning. You will find um, you know the. Um, uh, writings that you need to support whatever yeah. argument you want to put okay. forth. So it boils right back down to who has the authority to make that final decision. We all have our own ideas, but who has the authority to say yeah. you're right and you're wrong? That's very interesting because that's the same thing that happened during the Reformation. It's that the, the Reformers themselves had lots of quotes from St. Augustine and other church fathers mm -hmm. to defend the changes that they were making in the understanding mm -hmm. of justification and Scripture. But again, who has the authority to pick which of the quotes from the early right. fathers is to be definitive, or why not look at the whole package and mm -hmm. recognize that hey, Justin Martyr was a wonderful saint, but he wasn't perfect. Right. Y you know, not everything that he said necessarily right. is infallible. You right. need an infallible teacher to discern that. Exactly. Right. Uh, it looks like we have another email looking at us. This is from Terry. Thank you. Hello, and God bless. My question is this. I have a friend who lives overseas and was raised a Catholic. Within the past year, she converted to the Mormon faith. I believe there was a romantic influence involved. I have sent her various articles and have emailed her several times. I have prayed for her often. Is there anything else I can do to reopen her eyes to the Catholic faith? There's two questions here. The last one, what can she do? But this romantic influence mm -hmm. aspect, isn't that a part of the whole missionary concept of the Mormonism? It is, very much so. And, and the other thing is, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've had people get in contact with me and tell me that they are engaged or they're dating or uh, they, they are attracted to a Mormon and um, they're considering becoming a Mormon um, because that would make the other person happy to be a Mormon. Um, are they actually? influence the, the the Mormon young people influenced to do kind of evangelistic dating in America? Um, the, they're influenced to go out and to evangelize anyone they come into contact okay. with. Yes, that's that's one of the things that the Mormons are, are very um, good about um, having everyone take advantage of whatever opportunities they have mm -hmm. to share with other people. Mm -hmm. And um, any contacts that people made, they, they merely pass the name on to the missionaries, and the missionaries will pick up the rest of the work if, if they want to do it that way. But yes, um, you know, sometimes the, the dating thing is, is used as an evangelization mm -hmm. tool too, well, unfortunately. How about her second question? Uh, what can we do? To, to reach out to those, either friends or family. Or right. Or it's, it's very difficult to, to reach out to someone and convince them that, that what they're doing is, is wrong. What we need to do is do that in, in charity, in love, and, and um, concern for the individual, right. and try to help them to understand the truths of our faith and our beliefs. Um, we should never um, criticize the individual. We should just try to work on the doctrine and uh, explain and defend what it is that we believe and why that is different from what they believe. We need to know our faith very, Absolutely. very well. Absolutely. We cannot and share it unless we know it. 
That's right. right. And, and live it very faithfully. Right. Well, I know we've got lots of questions. We didn't even get in to talk about why yeah. Mormons are so interested in genealogies. Right. We didn't get to that big issue, which right. uh, many of us who've done some genealogical work are thankful for the for the work that they've done that's on the internet, but but why? Quickly, real quick, got like two seconds. Okay, why genealogy? <laughs> okay, the um, Mormons believe that the spirits that, that are in heaven um, and that have not been baptized and received into the Mormon church are waiting to, to go into the Mormon church and that being baptized for those deceased for them, people um, will will help them to, to become Mormons. Free them from their sins? Um, yes, okay. and also uh, they will be preached by the missionaries in heaven. So if you get them baptized and they get preached to, they're all set and they're Mormons. Right. Steve, thank you for coming back. Thank you very much. Very informative. And thank we also you. appreciate your witness and, you. and all you've come through to follow Jesus Christ. So thank you. And thank you for joining us on the journey home. I look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless.